Thank you very much for that uh, generous uh, introduction. It's just a truly great honor for me to be giving this uh, Mendel Lecture. Uh, of course, first, uh, Mendel himself was just an ex exceptional, exceptional scientist, showed us how to collect data meticulously, not rush into judgment, and, and, and the phenomenal number of observations he conducted in thousands is something we would all as scientists like to exemplify. Uh, the other reason I, when I received this uh, news of this award from Father Ellis is that it recognizes uh, the fact that there's no intrinsic conflict between true science and true religion. And, and to me, that's what got me really, really excited about this because I have come to the conclusion after working in this area of climate change for the last 43 plus years, that to solve this problem, which I think of as an existential threat, requires an alliance between science, religion, and policy. I'll mention some of that in my lecture later and then uh, tomorrow too. So uh, what am I going to talk to you about today? First is, how is climate changing? Why is it changing? How do we know what we know? And how much time do we have? And uh, time permitting, what are the solution options we have? Just so uh, I know, in a few weeks from now, you're going to forget about everything I say today. But I'd like you to remember uh, two things. First, if we don't do anything about it, and we are not doing much so far, this in a remarkably short time going to reach a uh, dangerous to catastrophic stage and then morph into an existential threat for all of us. And the second thing I'd like you to remember is that there is still time to solve the problem. Not too long, but some time. And it's just going to require cooperation and collaboration. And it's not, we're not going to solve it by pointing fingers at this problem, whether it's fossil fuel industry or those who don't believe in what we say. So it's going to request cooperation. So let me start off with probably the most dramatic uh, climate change news. Sorry, I didn't learn how to advance this. Is that the clicker or? No. Someone needs to help me with how to advance the slides. I tried that. Ah. Someone was going to get me the clicker. <laughs> So just last week, I'm sure many of you heard about this uh, fire in Northern California. Uh, it shows, it's a satellite image, the uh, sort of ironically named town Paradise. Uh, that town was entirely wiped out with fires. Uh, we still don't know how many have perished, at least it's more than 50 plus, about 600 have not been identified. What's the connection between the fire and climate change? I'll later show you a single equation. Thermodynamic equation could give you the whole story about how climate change is linked with this. In the same spirit, just a month earlier, 
October 9th, we all know, the panhandle was kicked, I mean, hit with Hurricane Michael. And uh, what's the connection between intense hurricanes and climate change? Again, the same thermodynamic equation which links climate change with fire, links climate change with hurricanes. Mind you, I'm not suggesting there would not have been a Hurricane Michael without climate change, or there would not have been a fire without climate change. What climate change has do does, which we know precisely, is makes them a lot more intense, a lot more worse than they would have been otherwise. Okay? So the issue of cli linking climate change with extreme weather was just refined in the last five years. Until then, we were not sure ourselves, okay? It is now so compelling evidence that the normally conservative American Meteorological Society, which represents 15,000 of us, climate scientists, forecasters, and anyone involved in the weather business, they declared, after reviewing all of the data, that we are experiencing new weather extremes because we have created a new climate. And that's what I want to show you today with my own science, how we have created a new climate. I think we should not fool ourselves. We are not living in the climate we inherited, or at least I inherited, when I was born in 1944. So you don't have to do the math how old I am. I'm 73 years old. <laughs> All right, but, but the link with the extreme weather has made public health such a dominant issue. Many of us are pivoting from focusing on uh, polar bears, glaciers, uh, corals. We've tried all this, we haven't, it hasn't worked. We are now focusing on public health. And I uh, organized a meeting teaming up with some uh, uh, famous economists at the Vatican. This is the Pontifical Academy of Science. It used to be a summer palace of Pope Pius. It accommodates just 80 of us. This academy, very few know about this, including amongst the Catholics, that uh, it's one of the most prestigious science academy. And there are only 80 of us. We are not elected there because of our uh, race or our religious affiliations. There are many uh, atheists who are members of that. And they are chosen there purely for scientific contributions. Anyway, there we concluded, just last year, with unchecked climate change and air pollution, the very fabric of life on Earth, including that of humans, is at grave risk. Mind you, we had many healthy f physicians from Harvard, World Health Organization, we collectively looked at the data. And in fact, uh, 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 Stephen Hawking, the most legendary uh, astrophysicist, is a member of the academy. He signed and he sent a personal note to me through his uh, assistant that he would like to help us deal with climate change. And sadly, within uh, six weeks of that, he passed away. So these are strange things for someone like me. I work on the esoteric part of climate change, the physics of the radiation field. So how did I get into all this about health? So I need to briefly tell you about where my journey started. This is a village in South India. Uh, I took this picture. Uh, when I turned 60, now you can do the math, I was born in 1944, so guess when I took it. That was my grandfather's uh, home. I spent about at least 10 to 12 summers just on that house, sitting on that veranda. It was so hot, you can't go inside the house. And it was too hot to go outside. The best place is on the veranda. And we'll just look at mad dogs going on the street and chasing them. That's what I did. 
So why did that topless kid come to America? I had a single-minded goal. <laughs> I, I wanted to come here, get a quick degree, join General Motors, and buy that Chevy Impala. <laughs> Most of the kids here, you wouldn't know what Chevy Impala is, probably. So, uh, it was to my horrible luck, when I came to America, my professor asked me to work on climate of Mars and Venus. I had never heard the word Mars or Venus till he told me. So, it's a long story. I got into climate change, which found myself getting a paper hug in three years ago with Pope Francis. So now I'm pursuing the common good. And I'll later tell you, uh, time permitting, uh, what happened to my Impala dream, but you can guess. <laughs> so I need to take you, start with my science, which is what I'll do now. Uh, after I got my PhD, it took me about three to three and a half years. I was studying the climate of Mars and Venus. And I, I went back to India. My father, after hearing what I did, told me, look, this was 1973. America is the only country rich enough to pay someone working on such esoteric things. You should go back to America. So I went back, fortunately got a job at NASA. And I helped design the first climate satellite. What we wanted to do was basically measure how much was the energy coming into the planet, how much was leaving, and how does the atmosphere regulating this. So to give you a 30-second briefing on how climate is determined, our fundamental energy source is sunlight, that's what heats everything. About 30% of this reflected back to space Right? The remaining 70% heats the planet, and the planet gives off this energy as heat radiation or infrared radiation. But the mysterious thing is the atmosphere, intervening atmosphere, behaves like a blanket. Right? Keep this metaphor. It's the most scientifically correct metaphor for greenhouse effect. A blanket keeps you warm on a cold winter night, not because the blanket gives you any heat, it traps your body heat. That's exactly how some atmospheric gases behave. So I wanted to measure the thickness of that blanket. And uh, let me just see. Yeah. So you see the sun, you see the satellite. And I use, I'll take the telescope in the satellite to scan in between clouds and measure the radiation, heat radiation coming from the planet. And that's what you see, what we measure from the satellite. In this unit, it's watts per square meter. Not really important, you know, the uh, unit. It's 268, which is coming out. So then we had a lot of data on the surface and how much the surface was giving out, he, uh, radiating. That was 400, 399. So the surface had to radiate 400 watts per meter squared so that 268 can escape to space. A third of the energy which the surface was radiating was trapped by this blanket, okay? And compare that with how we have changed that blanket. We have just made the blanket thicker by about 200% three watts. I'll tell you what's doing that. But the basic blanket thickness is mainly from water vapor. It's not human-made, it's God-given atmospheric water, which is in the form of vapor. Without the greenhouse effect by water vapor, the planet would be frozen like Mars. None of us could live here. So we need the greenhouse effect. The other constituent contributing to that is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also by natural processes, comes from volcanoes, uh, and, uh, from the interior of the Earth, so we need carbon dioxide. All we are doing 
is adding to the thickness of the blanket. Putting too much carbon dioxide, I'll tell you how much. Just like anything, right? I love a glass of wine. I know if I take too much wine, it's not good for me. So CO2 we need, but what the problem is, we are putting too much of it, okay? So just to uh, give you a good handle, think of those arrows as energy coming in from the sun. Okay, in this unit, I didn't want to, I took off the scientific units. Think of 10 arrows coming in. Three are reflected back by clouds, uh, land surface, glaciers, etc. So seven goes in, and the seven has to come out, otherwise the planet would overheat. So we measured that precisely with that satellite. We measured 10 was coming in, we measured three was going out, and the heat radiation escaping the planet was seven. But when we measured what's coming from the surface, that was 11 arrows. So the surface has to radiate so much to get rid of seven because of the greenhouse blanket. Okay, so that's, I gave you a background about nature, what it's doing, how is the climate determined. Now let's talk about what we are doing to it. Okay? So anything you take, the trees, fuel, when you burn something, you put out carbon dioxide because fuel is basically hydrocarbons. <clears throat> Carbon and hydrogen atom attached together. When you light it, it combines with the oxygen. Carbon becomes carbon dioxide and then it releases some energy. <clears throat> so ever since Mr. James Watt time, <clears throat> the 18th uh, century, when we started massively using coal and then gas, we have been dumping carbon dioxide. How much have we put already, emitted? On the bottom I'm showing that's two trillion tons of carbon dioxide since 1750. Imagine that. About 45% of it is still up there. That's what my institution, a famous scientist, measured it. We know how to measure it precisely. So there is about 980 billion tons of carbon dioxide up there. Imagine that. Just give you another uh, example to relate to the magnitude. That's equivalent to 450 billion cars circling the planet. The sad thing is it's in the form of a gas. If it had been actually solid, we wouldn't be able to see the sky. That is how much junk we have put. To give you another reference point, we know we are all choking in plastic, right? The plastic is only 300 million tons. This is 950 billion tons, thousand times more junk is there. And so that's acting like a blanket and trapping the heat. So until 1975, <clears throat> scientists thought the only greenhouse gas we had to worry about is carbon dioxide. This is when I got into the field, I had to forget about my Impala dream, and worked on my first study on this, and stumbled onto this remarkable fact of chlorofluorocarbons. You would have heard CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, in the context of the ozone hole. See, the chlorofluorocarbon has chlorine, sunlight, and it was used as refrigerants and propellants. So when you leak it into the air, sunlight splits the chlorine, and the chlorine is a bleach. <clears throat> it was just destroying the ozone layer, which is protecting us from UV, okay? But my work was totally independent of that. On the climate, I found the CFCs were such a powerful, powerful super blanket that a ton of them had the same effect as 10,000 tons of carbon dioxide. Of course, when I published it, very few believed that. 
In fact, some famous Harvard physicist called it BS. I, I don't think I can expand what that means. <laughs> so you can imagine, I was an obscure little Indian guy from a village. And so I was st hiding for a few years till others could repeat my, uh, and convince themselves. So just to give you a, a few physics background, I'm including this slide just because I heard there are some astrophysicists in the selection committee, it's for their benefit. So I told you that uh, our body, the heat radiation, right? That's what the planet gives off. But if you split that heat in terms of wavelengths, okay? So on the bottom, I give the infra, these are the wavelengths, you know, light is basically oscillating uh, energy source. So on the top, you see the smooth is where the surface was radiating over the ocean. This is again measured from the satellite. And then you see the wiggly curve. That was what was escaping. So the black shaded region is the thickness of the blanket. So each gas was absorbing in discrete wavelengths, carbon dioxide, water vapor, you can see. But then the thinnest region of the blanket is we call it window. Those are the only wavelengths Mother Nature has to ventilate its heat to space. Okay, in terms of the unit, it's about eight to 10 microns and 10 to 12. That's exactly where the CFCs were trapping light. So go back to the blanket. The blanket has holes. Nature put those holes so that your body can ventilate its heat, otherwise it'll get too hot. The pollutant CFCs were plugging up that hole one by one. Later, uh, other scientists got into this and Pandora's box was open. There are many other gases we are putting, okay? So there was one, uh, one thing else which was missing. The planet was heating faster than even accounting for these gases. So I got curious about that. And that other thing was what's called soot or black carbon. When you have fires in your barbecue or forest fires, the smoke contains the soot. The other source of the soot is the black smoke coming out of your diesel trucks. They are the most potent absorber of sunlight. See, the blanket traps your body heat, but the smoke particles trap sunlight directly. Okay, so making the blanket into an electric blanket. So we did a major experiment off of the Indian subcontinent in one of the most polluted regions of the planet. And uh, it was started off as a small piece. It became one of the biggest experiments. I had the privilege of leading this. There were over 200 scientists from uh, Europe, US, and India. We had ships, we had satellites one of the most comprehensive measurements of this problem. So what did we find? Yeah. This is a satellite image. That's the particulate pollution. You can see it's like a river, right? So we were diving into that plume and found out to measure the chemical composition. It's, it's a vir virtual chemical soup. It's everywhere including in here. I don't want to f you to feel overconfident. <laughs> it's, it's everywhere, except its intensity is so large there in India and other polluted, we can see it. You can see the soot was about 10%, okay? There is a story there between that soot discovery and uh, my joining the Vatican and changing my life. I'll, I'll come to that later. Let's stick with the science, but we wanted to measure how much heating it was trapping, okay? So then, last 10 years, I developed uh, drones. This is before, long before Jeff Bezos discovered drones to deliver our packages for Amazon. And we miniaturized instruments, flew these 
three drones simultaneously, one above the plume, one below, and one inside, and measure precisely how much sunlight was being trapped and heating the planet. It was enormous. Later we found it was one of the reasons the uh, Himalayan glaciers are melting away. So just to bring that story to a closure, this is how we are changing the planet. Carbon dioxide, area of the sphere is equal to the thickness of the blanket. On the other side, we call super pollutants. I talked to you about CFCs. Then methane was added. Methane is what leaks out of your gas pipes. And when you throw food into the garbage and they take it to the landfill, methane escapes. Methane is about 30 times more potent, which is called super pollute, and then so on. And then you see the black carbon. The reason I went to this is that I would, now this climate science has become so politicized in America that everything we know is based on data. Just like everything Mendel knew was from his data. So climate science is data driven, data determined, okay? So we know within 15% how much heat we have added to the planet. Now the question is, how is it going to respond to this heating, right? It's a complex system. So that was what I was really after. So now I'm going to uh, mention, so let's do a simple thought experiment, okay? You were so far in the bedroom with the blanket, now I want you to go into the kitchen, right? Put your cooking range, put a pan of pot of water, and you increase the heating, ultimately what will happen? the water would disappear, right? From liquid, it would become vapor, water vapor, which gives you humidity. But we just learned water vapor is the most potent greenhouse gas. So you to add the thickness of the blanket by adding carbon dioxide, CFCs, the planet warms up, the ocean warms up, but what does it do? It will evaporate more moisture, just like your body when you get too hot, you sweat. That's what the ocean does. So then the blanket gets even thicker. The planet warms and the blanket gets thicker. We call it positive feedback. This was what was suggested by Swante Arrhenius in 1890, the famous Swedish thing. But you know, uh, there's one thing in me, I don't believe anything anybody tells me, unless I can smell it, measure it, and figure out what's going on. So I was after this. So got into the fundamental equation. The vapor pressure increases exponentially. Well, I don't expect you to follow the equation there. But when you do some mathematical manipulation, it tells you each degree of warming increases the evaporation by 6 to 6%. 6 it could be as high as 10 at the same time, the air can hold 6% more. That is the equation why your humidity, summer is humid, winter is cold and dry. Summer is warm and humid simply because of that equation. So what does it do to the fires? Water is evaporating like crazy from your leaves, tree trunks, from the soil. California is already warm by a degree and a half. So if your rainfall doesn't match up that, things are going to get steadily dry. It's inescapable. Why is your hurricanes getting strong? There is more humidity and it has more energy. Every degree warming, the air has more energy and hurricanes form to release that energy. Because when you condense, you give off that heat. So hurricanes and storms are nature's way of getting rid of this junk heat we are putting into the planet. Anyway, so I wanted to test was that equation valid in a complex system? So most of the work I'm talking about was all done with my students. So here we took microwave data from all over the planet, water vapor, satellite data, and plotted water vapor amount as a function of surface temperature. We were shocked. I have never seen data fitting so tightly. Water vapor was increasing. 
But that's not enough for me. Remember, I'm a stubborn oriental. Don't expect any, any, accept anything anyone says. I need to figure it out for myself. So I wanted to see, was the blanket thickening? Right? So that was the next data. So uh, ignore the top one. That's with the satellite data, how we collected. Look at that curve. It was shockingly linear the way the Nobel laureate Arrhenius told us. You warm the planet with CO2, it's going to thicken the blanket and water vapor is going to amplify it. That linear slope is, if you do all the arithmetic, shows the amount of junk CO2 we have put in should warm the planet by about two degrees. So if that was the only thing going on, I wouldn't worry so much. There was another thing going on at the same time. This, uh, I went on a cruise uh, to Alaska just this year to see the sea ice. It's going to melt away. I wanted to see it, give it my blessings, and give it a good send off. So, but look at that sea ice there. When there's no sea ice, the rock is dark. When something is dark, it absorbs more sunlight. When something is light, it reflects sunlight. Okay? And on the ocean. So that means we have already heated the planet by a degree, which means the sea ice has retreated and it's soaking in more sunlight. So that was the PhD thesis of my student, Christina Pistone. We uh, wrote this paper four years ago. Look at what she, the top one shows the sea ice, 1979, and the bottom was 2012. Look at the who, hole which has opened up. This is happening in the, in the planet. How can we say this whole thing is hoax? Okay, I'll, I'll bring to that point. I think science needs religion. I'll, I'll, I'll later tell you why. Anyway, these maps don't make us happy. As scientists, we need to see the actual data. So this shows, remember I showed you I launched the climate satellite? What it shows is 1980, Arctic was reflecting 38% of sunlight, bright. By 2010, it had become dark. It's only th th darker, 32%. So if you were orbiting the planet, you would, have, you would be seeing it getting darker and darker and darker. And she estimated the amount of energy we have added, this is data, nothing to do with theory, is enough to, is equivalent to putting another 250 billion tons of carbon dioxide. The blanket is getting thicker. Okay, so when we add all this, the planet should have already heated by about two degrees, and I'll talk to you about that next. So what I hope I've persuaded you so far is that we know how we are changing the planet, and we know how the planet is going to respond. Just from data, I didn't use any models, any theories. So got curious about this, teamed up with the famous meteorologist, Alan Madden, and we made a prediction 38 years ago. We said, to test the theory, we have to test its predictions, right? That's how Einstein's relativity theory was shown, that stars would bend the light. So we took the best statistical models of data and uh, our climate, and said, if this theory is right, the warming should be detectable by year 2000. So I'm here now showing you temperature, global average temperature. There are tens of thousands of thermometers have gone into this. Starting at the temperature from 1860, we subtracted the mean. So 1860 was colder by about half a degree. The planet went warming and cooling, and that's part of nature, mind you, okay? That's what nature does. Some years warmer, some years colder. See, when we published our paper in 1980, the planet was still in its cold phase. Again, some scientists laughed at us. 
What are these, the planet is drifting into an ice age. These idiots are proposing it's going to warm. And look at what happened in 2000. It took off. And it's been warming, warming and warming. Okay? So that is the signal has become larger than the noise. Those who say nature changes by itself, they are right. There is natural variability. But what they don't understand is that doesn't mean we can't change the climate, right? So, I want to end there as far as science. I want to talk about what's there for the future. So, uh, this is the initiative I started bending the curve, okay, about uh, five years ago. Anyway, look at that uh, schematically, cartoon-wise. We have put, as of 2010, I put, we already put two trillion tons. We are putting about 40 billion tons every year. Do you know what that is, emitting junk? 40, for each man and woman and children, we are tossing seven tons of junk in the air. That's equal to about four, four cars you're tossing. But as I mentioned to Pope Francis, half the pollution is coming from the wealthiest one billion. So among this wealthy one billion, every man, woman, and child, we are tossing about seven cars into the sky. Just junk, okay? So by the time we put the 2030, that's only 12 years from now, the planet would heat up from one to one and a half. If you still go on this meriless path by 2030, then by 2050, we would have put the fourth trillion ton, and the planet is already locked up to two degree warming. Okay? So that's the time scale. We need to do something to stop it by 2030, another 12 years. So let me talk to you about what do health experts say if you reach the two degrees. A billion and a half would be exposed to deadly heat. Deadly heat is when you stay outdoors for more than three hours without protection, you would have a heat stroke, okay? 600 million exposed to vector-borne disease, Lyme disease, which is spreading in America as part of that vector-borne disease, widespread droughts, this, the fourth is the most critical mass displacement and migration. We know what happened to the world with just a million Syrians. We are talking about 50s, 100 million. Just this last fire in California, 100,000 had to be evacuated. Right? I don't know how many of you know, the saddest thing is uh, the Paradise Fire. 52 people have identified to be dead. Many of them just in their cars. It was so fast they couldn't escape. Drive through it, okay? So, but there is a 5% probability we can, the warming can exceed three degrees. So you can ask, what is the big deal about three degrees? Yesterday's snowstorm dropped the temperature by 10 degrees, right? But when you talk about globally heating the planet, it's a complex system. I'll show you what a Princeton model is predicting when you hit the three degrees. On the top one is the drought. Of course, you can see the whole of Southwest. I don't think any agriculture could survive. Look at Amazon, that's what worries me. There is so much carbon is trapped in the Amazon forest. You send it to drought and fires. And the whole of uh, Southern Europe, Australia, southern south parts of Africa. So you may think, oh, this is just a model 40 years from now. Look at what happened last five years. That's the bottom one. It's eerily similar to the pattern above, except it's not as strong. Look at California, look at Amazon, look at Australia. It's already here. Nature is giving us, Mother Nature is giving us early warning. We are just tone deaf and blind, not seeing it. So, enough of the bad news, how do we solve the problem? 
See, I told you about the India pollution. That pollution alerted me. I wanted to look at the cause of that pollution. And that took me to my grandmother's kitchen. This, is, this was done in Himalayas. We were in South India, but that kitchen she cooked, where I used to sit in the front instead of that cat. Those days, they will feed the boys first, with all apologies to the women and girls here. I had four sisters, but my grandmother would bring me first and feed me first. So I still have fond memories of that kitchen. I didn't realize half her health problem was from that inhaling the smoke. And the thing I want to talk about is that three billion people still have not discovered fossil fuel. They're living like that, okay? Their contribution to climate change is 5%. But we all know who are going to perish first when the thing drives. So it's a huge ethical moral problem, okay? The second moral problem of this is the fact I have four grandchildren. When I talk about the three degree warming, the planet, immersed in drought, I think of this, I'm sending them on a plane which has a 5% chance of falling down from the sky. I wouldn't get on the plane if I tell any of you there's even a 20% chance of the plane coming down. You're not going to get on it. But all people here, 40 years and older, we are sending our children and grandchildren on that plane, which is 5% is not that low probability. So my realization of this came at just the exact time when I turned 60. Now I gave you the year, so you don't have to do the math. It's 2004. I was sitting in Maldives with my experiments. I get this letter from uh, Pope John Paul II. He elected me to the academy. It's only 80 scientists. It's an international in scope. We sit right in the Vatican. We report to the Pope. It's multiracial, non-sectarian, and non-denominational. Okay, it's just an amazing academy. I don't have the story to tell you how it transformed me, but 11 years later, I teamed up with about 50 faculty from all 10 campuses of UC, and we came with the solution to this problem. The middle is science pathways, okay? Uh, I'll come to that. Uh, but what we came up with is that, look at the top, societal transformation. We are not solving this problem because we don't have technology, not because we have governance. We need society to be transformed. And you all know that, right? I live in Southern California. I have solar on my rooftop. I'm making money, solar is cheaper. But less than 5% of San Diegans have solar. And in fact, uh, I switched to solar because if General Motors make an electric Impala, I would be the first to buy it. Because <laughs> I'm not hurting you. I'm just getting my power from there, right? I'm saying this for another reason. We are not asking you to go back to Middle Ages. We are not saying solving the climate problem, in fact, takes you to the future for our good. So how do we uh, address this issue? This is another report we published, we released at the Vatican. Don't bother reading all that, it's just too busy. Basically, we have three levers we have to pull. The first lever is make the planet carbon neutral. How do you do that? The idea is very simple. Convert all the end use, your electricity, your home heating, your cooking, to electricity, and generate the electricity using solar, wind, geothermal, right? And if need be, even nuclear. All these technologies are here, okay? So the carbon emissions goes to zero. The second is, but that's not going to stop us It'll take too long, 30, 40 years. We don't have that time. Fortunately, we have another lever. Remember my work on CFCs? These pollutants, methane, black carbon, 
the hydrofluorocarbons, their lifetime is two weeks to 10 years. What does that mean? If all of us put filters in our diesel cars, that black carbon is gone within a week and we give improved cook stoves to this three billion people, that's gone within three weeks. So that would bend the curve within 15 years, cool the climate by about half a degree, give us more time. And we need a third lever. Unfortunately, all of this would still not prevent this dangerous warming. We need to suck that carbon out of the air, about half the junk we have put. How do we do that? Grow forests, improve soil capacity to hold carbon, and then mechanical extraction. Many of these technologies are there, but they need to be developed, okay? So I think I'm, I'm pushing against my time. I'm going to, this just shows math, you know, graph wise what I said. These ideas have fortunately caught, caught on. Uh, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, read our paper and started this coalition, cut these super pollutants. So when she lost the election, there was only one person on this planet more depressed than her husband, Bill Clinton, that's me. Because she was going to push this. Okay? And then fortunately, our governor, Jerry Brown, listened to this, and we have passed laws to pull both the levers, make the California carbon neutral, cut down the shortly pollutants. Then teaming up with my daughter, Nitya, who is a wireless technologist, and my another daughter, Tara, we are giving clean cook stoves and cooking them with a carbon uh, market here, using cell phones and wireless technology that, that people here, they want to offset the carbon, they can send the check to a woman who would buy the stove and replace her cooking. And the other one we are doing societal transformation is, uh, we at University of California have created this climate solution course. Not focusing on the bad news, but how to solve the problem. And now we are trying to uh, take that course, export it to all the other universities in the US. I'm mainly focusing on the red states. I'm happy to say Texas A&M is gonna teach it and we're gonna teach this course in Omaha, Nebraska, and already it's energizing many students. So that takes me to the last one I wanted to talk about. I personally don't think we are going to get enough public support, either in the US or even in the European nations, enough public support to go for drastic action. That's what we need. And the part of the reason is, Climate science has become extremely political. The country, as you know, is divided, and climate science has got mixed up with the, all the other issues which divides us. So we are thinking we can reach to people through faith-based institutions, churches, temples, and mass. And, and I, I want to tell you, I would not have thought along these lines, but for what Pope Francis is promoting this, you know, the encyclical Laudato Si, without any hesitation, I can tell you, is the best document ever written on climate change science and uh, how to help with the people. So uh, I'm encouraging all my fellow scientists, academics, to talk about this in religious institutions. And I want to tell you, uh, I had invited uh, the head of the evangelical, um, uh, American evangelist, Reverend Leith Anderson, who oversees 30,000 churches. He came to our meeting and, uh, and gave a very strong speech on climate change science. So it, the ground is slowly moving. I want to give you just two or three reasons why religion belongs in this and why they need to help solve the problem. First, I told you, we are sending three billion poor to their 
you know, destruction just because I want to drive on my Impala, right? Second is, we are sending our children and grandchildren on that plane, which has a 5% probability of crashing. Okay, that's the moral, ethical issue. As a scientist, I have no qualification to talk about it, but faith leaders can talk about this. Okay, so it makes a lot of sense to bring them into the picture. I am going to... So to my fellow academics, including those who voted for me in the committee, what can you all do? I think Goethe has already said it, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we just have to roll our sleeves and do. I can tell you, based on my experience, individual action would make a huge, huge impact. Thank you. So we have some time for some questions. There are some microphones out there in the audience. So as is our tradition with the Mendel Mendel Lecture, uh, Dr. Ramanathan would be happy to address some questions. So feel free to make your way to one of the microphones. Thank you for asking a question. I think that's one of the good. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question was how reliable are the temperature measurements I showed? They're depicting actual climate change. And that is one of the most important questions here. I'll tell you why that's relevant. For example, Philadelphia, we probably have one or two stations measuring temperature. Is that enough? Definitely not. You need thousands. So, so how do we then beat this uncertainty? We look at the spatial pattern. All the thermometers over the US give similar trend for long term once we remove the noise. The noise is year to year change, five years to another five years. Even that didn't convince me. See, when the United Nations verified our prediction in 2000, I never talked about this because of that problem. What convinced me that I started talking about solutions and going to the church is that by 2010, the oceanographers released their data. We have been measuring ocean temperatures using buoys, right? They sink, they float on the water. Every week or so, they'll go for a drink. They'll go down to 1,000 meters, measure temperature, come back up, send the data to the satellite, and then go for a drink. There are about 15,000 such buoys. They showed the entire ocean is heating up. Our theory is that if just the surface heated and the ocean didn't heat, it's definitely not the blanket. It's something else. That is key. The second is the sea ice was retreating exactly as predicted. In fact, that retreat was even more. The third, for me, I'm a physicist. I needed to see the water vapor increase. That is to me is the greenhouse signal. And the whole planet has become humid. All the radar. If it was just relying on the temperature, I would not be persuaded because of the reasons you mentioned. Great talk. Um, 
So you emphasize involving faith leaders and, uh, and other members of society rather than just politicians, because clearly that hasn't gotten us anywhere the past 30 years. Um, but I, like you, I, you know, I, I believe in the science, I know the science, and I know, I know better, but I tell my students, like, I still, you know, my own behavior, you know, I still probably produce more CO2 than 95% of the world, even though I know better. And so I'm wondering to what extent, so involving faith leaders, are, are you saying we should involve them to influence people's action directly or to involve faith leaders to then um, encourage their followers to help bring about legislation that will then regulate. Because I, I, I feel like people just won't respond unless there's an economic legal incentive to do so. Yep. No, uh, great question. I think where the alliance with the faith leaders can help is to reach out to people with the facts. I can tell you from my experience of Omaha, the university, one of the theologians organized this meeting, and most of the people came of the 750 or farmers. At the end of it, they lined up and talked to me. They said, Dr. Ram, we didn't know this was based on science. We thought this whole thing was junk. So, and, but I think it was easy for them to believe because as farmers, they are seeing the climate change. They don't need my data, they're seeing it. So I think the first thing we can do is to reach out to people with the facts. I don't think we need to tell them what to do. We just give them the facts. And the other thing I would say is even informed public or academics you know, like you, very few realize how urgent this problem is. That disaster is waiting around the corner just 10 years from now, right? I don't know in California for how long we can insure our house for fire. I don't know in the East Coast, Carolina and Florida, how many of them will be able to insure their house for floods? It's all coming. You know, as I tell my governor, Jerry Brown, he asked me in the fires, is this the new norm? I told him I would be so happy if this is a new norm. The problem is there is no norms. Just one each year is going to get, not each year, each five years, is going to be worse than the previous five years. So those kind of things, we need to communicate now. Fif 10 years from now, we don't need that. Everyone would experience it, but then it may be too late. So I think the first thing is to inform the public. And the second thing is why I'm persuading this to me is the route to go, alliance with faith, is that it's too late for individual actions. For me, I gave up my Impala car, but that those kind of actions are meaningless. It needs now top-down policies so we can tell the fossil fuel companies still make money but switch to renewables. Don't dig that coal. Why don't you look up in the sky and you still make your money? So that's, it requires top-down action. At this wrong moment, America has gotten divided. I'm trying to see how to unpack climate change science from all the liberal Democrat issues which divide us. So I, I'm an Augustinian. I preach on Sundays. And I recognize that trying to speak about climate change to a congregation feels meaningless and almost impossible because it feeds that basic division progressive, liberal, versus conservative, whatever. And so the, the, the issue for me isn't the facts. Um, I began Villanova in 1959 as a physics major. So 
facts matter to me, but it's the courage. The courage to be willing to speak by one's actions and have individuals do that because it can become contagious. To find some way, in other words, for each person to be so convinced of the facts, if they're capable of appreciating them, and every professor and priest and minister and, and imam, to, to find a way to ask us not questions about climate change, but questions about truth. Yeah. And because we live in a society where lies have become the norm, if there is such a thing, this finding a way to have the guts to be able to act in ways that can influence others does seem to me to need to appeal to the individual. And that's not a question, but it's the best I can do. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I certainly uh, see your point that individual actions gives you the moral authority to talk to others to change. And to me, the main change which is needed here is for us to elect the right people. I'm not by saying right people, meaning Democrats or Republicans. Those who think, take climate science for the facts and know we have to act. So, so I was thinking about your, the predicament you mentioned is that if my fellow scientists, academics are willing to go to churches like yours where you're open, and I'm thinking if they could give that strength one needs of the scientific backing. So, but I'm not saying that you don't need the backing from individual actions. So it's, it's I see and feel your pain. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. I'm an engineer and a graduate student here. Why wouldn't a carbon tax work for everybody's benefit right off the bat? So here it is. I have to wear my uh, conservative hat or libertarian. I know a friends with a billionaire, extremely nice person, but he doesn't believe in all that. So simply that it needs proper governance, right? Who would you give the tax to? You have to trust someone. And if 50% of Americans don't trust the government, I feel that's the divide. They're not giving the money. That's what I've learned, talking to the other side. What is your problem with solving this? You know, when you look at the mathematics, the arithmetic of this, it's $150 a year per person to solve this problem. Sadly, climate change is a $150 a year problem. We are willing to send our kids on that plane for 150 bucks. So I don't think it's the money which has discouraged them, it's the mistrust of governments to deal with this. I'm just, but my sample is very limited few hundred I've talked to, that's their issue. So unless we understand the other side, I feel we are not going to solve this problem. My, you know, policymakers, right, $30 a ton will solve the problem. They never tell me, how are we going to get the right people elected to make this happen? Uh, so, we've seen economy shift quickly for any sense of urgency, like the U.S. did uh, right before World War II. That, in the case of the sustainability and renewables movement, it would be a complete shift that will basically be a revolution. But it's usually guided by a sense of urgency to act 
what do you think can be an event that would happen in 10, 20 years that would cause the nations to finally but join and decide to act all together and do an actual revolution with every aspect of society involved? Perfect. You, you, you already opened your question with an answer. It's going to take a disaster like Pearl Harbor or World War II to unite us, right, to solve this. And I think more than half of us have to feel that threat in person, uh, losing our home or our child affected. And sadly, I am predicting that's going to happen by before 2030. So I know that's why I'm optimistic, not completely depressed, is that we are going to solve this problem. But I wanted to, to solve this problem before the disaster strikes. So uh, you're young. You will be around by 2030. I may not be. And, and you will see. Because our science is now so clear, we are going to shoot past that degree and a half. When we pass that, shoot past that degree and a half warming, what that means compared to one degree now, based on the equation I showed, everything we are experiencing, floods, hurricanes, all this, would amplify by another 50%. So it's not half a degree. Things are going to get intensified by 50%. And then we would unite. Thank you. But I'm hoping we would unite before that. Um, I was wondering, so when we were going over what we could do to fix um, carbon dioxide emission, we went over um, taking out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And I was wondering if we have the technology now, and if we do, why aren't we like, using it yes. already? The, there, are, there are many ways to do that, but none of them have been tested for scale. There is a group who said they have done this. I got excited and went to see how many tons they have removed in a year. 35 tons. I'm talking about 35 billion tons. So the scale is missing. But in fairness to them, it's because they're not being funded. They're just using nickels and dimes to solve a trillion dollar problem. So it's an issue of, issue of putting, that's why I constantly feel that we need a top-down support. And then through education programs, we prepare a million young people to solve the problem. We are there. And I, I, there is a, there's a litany of about 15 different ways to do it. All right, last couple of questions. Uh, enjoyed your lecture very much. Um, so you, uh, your talk focused on, uh, and I think perhaps rightly so, uh, sort of the Western civilization, which is, which is, I think your implication that, you know, all that coal burning in India was about 3%, but most of the contributions we seem to be making out here and in the Western world. Uh, but with the rapid advancement that's happening in the BRIC countries, and especially India and China, and also um, I think you focus so much on the Christian, uh, who are only about 2 billion, and there are 5 billion non-Christians, you know, Hindus, Muslims, atheists in China especially. Um, and they are uh, very, uh, you know, they're saying you got there by destroying the environment. Why? How are we going to get there? Now, if you tell us to slow our development, how do you counter that? Because I think uh, the future contributions, perhaps, are going to be much more coming from that side of the world. No, but it, yeah, this is, I hope everyone heard the question that how about India and China? I'm focusing so much on America and just Christians. The first thing I want to, I'm so glad you asked that question. Remember I said a billion of us are contributing 50 to 60%. Out of that billion, 200 million are from China. 30 million are from India. 20 million are from Africa. So this has become clearly a global problem, okay? So that's why I deliberately don't say North, South, 
it's all of us who are in this. And uh, so why am I focusing on America? I, my personal experience, and I showed you that Indian Ocean experiment I did, there were 250 scientists, this was just 15 years ago. Everyone was looking for Americans to do the, take the leadership. And I think it's the same thing in climate change. Unless we take the lead, the rest of the others don't have that leadership, you know, we are the superpower. For example, just after America withdrew from the Paris summit, this year, Germany, which was on the super strong for renewables, is going back to coal. Australia is shipping coal like crazy. And uh, China, I, I, they're so massive, you know, Whatever they are doing is good, but it's nothing compared to the amount of pollution they are dumping. So we need someone, just to use uh, the one uh, who talked about the Augustinian church and moral authority, we need someone there with the technological authority, but the moral authority. I am doing this, you do too. We have lost that. So that's why I, I'm thinking we need America back on the leadership. Sorry, it looks like I, I drove it towards a depressing end. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a couple more. And then we'll Hi. Uh, I've heard that animal agriculture could have as much of an impact as gasoline cars. Do you think it's necessary to advocate for plant-based agriculture along with electricity as a source of energy? Yeah. Um, I need to preface this, okay. I, I started as a vegetarian in India, and when I came to this country, my, I was starving for two weeks. My roommate, who was a Jewish person from New York, took me to McDonald's, and afterwards there was no looking back for me as far as meat eating is concerned. <laughs> and the other reason I don't want to start with that is it will divide America further. You're then giving a chance to concert. So we told you the, all these guys are after us to change our lifestyle, okay? And the third reason, I'm not going after that first, is that fossil fuel is the main problem. We all know that, right? And I told you about my Chevy Impala. If I have solar on my rooftop, and uh, there is an electric Chevy Impala, how am I hurting you? Right? So, yeah, the plant-based diet is certainly is going to help. I don't see that as the main problem. Once we get people to work on this together on a common enemy, see, yours will create more enemies. I want to focus on one which will unite us. And then we take all these other issues. Last two questions. Okay. Um, so you mentioned in your presentation that there isn't enough public opinion or policy to take drastic changes to the reverse the effects of uh, climate. But you've also stated that in your previous answers that individual actions such as you giving up your Impala aren't enough to make change either. Are there any small changes the world can make as a collective instead of outside of voting the right people, since the world's pretty divided and that seems a little far-fetched at the moment, that would still have a significant impact if the world made those small changes as a whole. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm so grateful to you for asking that question. I have a chance to redeem myself from the way I answered to the previous question. <laughs> so let's talk about low-hanging fruits. 40% of the food we produce is thrown away. Right? And that goes to landfill and produces methane, which is 30 times more potent than the carbon we used to produce that food. So if we can start a movement, I'm trying to do that in my campus at UCSD. Same thing if you're a faculty student. If we can start a movement, we shall not throw food 
into landfill. So you ask, what can you do with it? What you need is a biodigester. You throw that food there, but you have to make sure the pipes are not leaking. Out comes methane. You burn it for your fuel, right? And the second, the compost, you put it into your land, it sucks in more carbon. So on the food area, it is it's atrocious. We throw, I throw 40%. I've measured it. I've tried my best, right? And it's done everywhere. In the developed countries, the food thrown is processed food, right? Our hamburgers, our tomatoes, which goes bad. So every major groceries, we force them to put a biodigester. They benefit from it, right? They can sell the compost, and they can use it to power their shop. So that's the first low-hanging fruit I would go after. I, I have a really big question. For me, like I worry a lot about big issues today like fake news and also with things like false information being taught in academics. Frankly, the last one's pretty terrible because academics are supposed to be institutions of truth, but if we're just teaching opinions, especially ones not based on actual facts, then like, what are we coming to? How are we going to solve this problem? This, this problem you're talking about is the fake news problem, or? Uh, fake news and also fake information taught in academics. Right. Compared to those problems, I'm a practical guy. I know climate change problem is solvable. So I'm focusing on that. Those issues look horrendously complex. And there's no scientific basis for that. So I, I, I don't have an answer to that. It, it's, it's, it, climate change is stuck in that fake news. We have been dismissed as junk science, hoax, etc. So I, I, my way of dealing with that is to partner with the religion so we can talk to people in a non-political forum about a problem which affects their life. So, uh, yeah, uh, that issue of the whole fake news and this, I don't have an, uh, any idea how to, how to address or solve that problem. Well, since that, so you don't really, since that one's a bit complex, how about this one? Like for a lot of workers, they're afraid of losing their jobs because of this sort of climate movement we're having. Like how do we convince them that we could assure that they find work even with these sort of changes? How can we tell them we'll make sure that you're kept in check too, that you're able to feed your families and that we're able to save the environment too? Thank you for asking a problem I can address. I would have felt sad having my last question say, I don't know how to solve that. Yeah, I, I think the question was, when we switch from this to renewable fuels, many are going to lose their jobs. I think I have the same worry about uh, artificial intelligence throwing so many Uber drivers out of their job, these young people depending on it. So I have an answer to that question, which is, that's one of the biggest mistakes we as climate scientists, policy makers, we did. We just said switch to renewables. We didn't think of it as a human problem. Do you know who alerted me to that? Pope Francis encyclical. He said, study is an, eco it's an integral ecology, interaction of the natural system with social system, okay? So, I, for the life of me, I, do, I cannot understand why uh, even people like Mr. Gore, all the Democrat senators and Congress are not thinking about how are we gonna relocate those who are depending on fossil fuels, right? 
in our solution set, we have one solution about how to retrain them or how to provide them with you know, stable income and for their retirement. So that has to become part of the climate policy. Those who are going to be impacted by switch to renewables, we take care of them, right? Without fossil fuels, I couldn't have come to America. But I've still been in my village chasing mad dogs. So it helped all of us, right? Our society is where we are because of fossil fuels. So we can't turn around and say, oh, we don't need you anymore. So we have to provide for them. And that's one of the fundamental flaws of all current climate policies. And that has to be fixed, and it's a fixable problem. All right, well, on that note, um, thank you. Oops, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ramanathan. Don't go anywhere yet, don't go anywhere yet, don't go anywhere yet. <laughs> As a, uh, as a parting gift to, to commemorate this occasion and your survival of your trek here from the airport, we have a little bit of a Villanova swag to give you uh, for the road. So uh, thank you once again. Join me again in thanking Dr. Ramanathan. <laughs>